I'm Phil, and I'm going to talk to you today about code review um, and how you can become a better developer, hopefully, by doing code review. Um, as a developer, you might think that code review isn't something you really want to do. You want to write code, not read code, but I promise you it can help. So just a little bit about me. Um, I work with WordPress.com VIP, um, and we do cloud hosting and support for high-profile, high-traffic WordPress sites. We look after some of the world's biggest brands who are using WordPress every day. Uh, we keep their sites secure, scalable, um, and safe. And we do that through code review. One of the reasons why these brands use us is because we do code review. It's one of the top things that they say is a benefit of the service we offer them. So hopefully quite a few of you have seen this. This is the first line of the automatic creed. Uh, automatic being my employer, obviously. Um, and as, as a developer, you have to learn constantly all the time because web development never stays still. Um, and you can do that by doing code review. So what is code review? You're basically looking for, you're looking at standards, the standards that um, are around to help you make sure your code uh, is, is of good quality. You're looking for simple mistakes. Everyone's done the, done the odd uh, missing semicolon thing. Sanity checking, making sure the code does what it's supposed to do, making sure you've actually, uh, the logic follows through. Um, and also looking for any performance issues. Uh, the odd, you know, maybe you've uh, accidentally put in a nasty query that's going to load on every single page of your website and it's going to take your database down if you get a spike of traffic. So why do it? So you want to keep your site safe. You want to make sure it's secure. You want to make sure that it's not easy to hack. Um, you don't want to, you know, leak any papers about tax avoidance, for example. Uh, you want to make sure that it's, um, it's scalable that when you, if you do get a nice big spike of traffic or you've got a high traffic website, that it's going to handle that traffic, that you're going to be able to take, you know, several million page views, for example. You want to make the code readable as well. Every, we've all done this. We've all gone back to our own code even, um, later down the line, and looked at it and thought, what the hell was I thinking? This is terrible code. Or you can't understand what it's doing. You've got a bunch of code and it doesn't say anything about what it's actually doing. Um, so you need to make sure it's understandable. And finally, but not obviously not least, is to learn. You can learn a lot by doing code review. Um, you learn from your own mistakes. When you've gone back to your code uh, many years later, you see what you've done wrong and you can fix that in the future. You can learn from other developers' code. You can see what they do differently, um, pick up on different ways to do things uh, just from reading their code. And this is what helps you to become a better developer. You look at code and you see other things, you, s you see mistakes you've made, and you can learn those. You can use standards and internalize those and make sure that when you're writing code in the future, that actually you're, you're, you're remembering those, those lines that you've, you've, you've read before. And you can take that in and, and, and think, hang on, previously I might have written this conditional this way, but actually I'm going to write it in this way because I've seen that before and it seemed like a better way to do it, or I know it's a better way to do it because the standard said so. So there's lots of ways you can do uh, code review. You can do automated code review to start with. Uh, one of the ways you can do is use uh, PHP Code Sniffer. Um, and there's some WordPress coding standards that you can use with PHP Code Sniffer to automatically look at your code and say, well, this, this could be better. Uh, you should do this conditional in this way, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's very, very light touchy. You don't have to um, do a lot. PHP Code Sniffer will also, if you, if you want it to, can actually rewrite your code. Um, to a certain extent to actually help you comply with those standards. Uh, there's a thing that we use in, in VIP called VIP Quick Start and VIP Scanner. Quick Start is a development environment. Um, some of you may have used uh, varying vagrant vagrants before. Uh, VIP Quick Start is, is basically VVV but slightly customized. It comes with VIP Scanner. VIP Scanner will scan your code with the PHP code sniffer and WordPress coding standards, but then it will also tell you things that are likely to be issues. It will tell you if you've got a really bad query, or it will tell you if you're using uh, things like extracts that might make your code uh, unsafe. You can do continuous in integration testing, so you could use things like PHP Code Sniffer or other tools um, as you're committing code into a repository to just check that code as you commit it in and tell you, flag any issues there. 
Um, there's also a tool called WP Enforcer, which is, is pretty neat. It, it also includes the coding standards, and we'll, we'll do some other stuff for you. The best kind of code review, uh, in my opinion anyway, is manual code review. So actually getting somebody else to look at your code, getting somebody to read your code. Um, so on VIP, this is what we do. Every single bit of code that comes into us, we review manually. Um, so we've got something stupid like 10 million lines of PHP and 7 million lines of JavaScript uh, that's all been reviewed by a human being. Uh, maybe even me. Um, and that's one of the best ways, because you learn then from each other. Uh, you learn what each other does, and you learn um, better ways to do things, better approaches to, to writing code. It helps you to internalize those standards as well. So the more and more you read code, and the more and more you see the same things pop up, you fix the same issues, you actually start to just remember those uh, instinctively. So one of the reasons why I've become a better developer since doing code review as part of my job is because I can write code and I instantly know to write it in a different way than I might have done before because I've internalized those standards of code review. Um, anybody want to offer an opinion as to when not to do code review? <coughs> no? Good, trick question. Never. <laughs> um, I, I am guilty of not doing code review sometimes. Um, you know, the odd little change. Uh, even little changes can, can break a site, so just be careful. Um, and finally, we're hiring. If you want to do code review and become a de better developer, then uh, come and join VIP if you like. Um, or just go and look at our documentation. Have a look at the, the code standards that we hold our clients to, and you'll make your, hopefully make your sites more secure, more scalable, and safer. And that's me. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about why switching to WordPress coding standards will ultimately make you a better developer and increase the quality of the code that you're writing. Uh, I'm a senior front-end and WordPress engineer at MakeDo. We're very proud to be sponsoring this event for the third time. Uh, you can, that's my blog and you can catch me on Twitter. So a bit about me and my story with coding standards. I, I've used a little bit of some standards like PSR2 in the past. Never really stuck. Um, moved on from that quite quickly. Uh, I'm quite OCD when it comes to things digital, really. So I like structure. I like, you know, to have something to stick to, to, um, you know, something that's nice and predictable. Um, I've started to work more on team projects a lot more. At my previous agency, I was very much responsible for the whole life cycle of, you know, the, the site. There's very rarely I'd be involved in large team projects. But now, at Make Do, that, that's changed an awful lot. Um, I've moved into writing plugins, and I'm trying to contribute to core an awful lot more now. So I'm a lot more conscious about the quality of my code and how other people are going to you know, perceive my code. Uh, and make do, we work with an awful lot of um, external agencies you know, for design and marketing. So again, we're more conscious about the product that we're handing over. That's got to be good quality, and they need to be able to dip back into that at a later date. So that's, um, that's something we're aware of. Uh, I switched for PHP back in September last year, so I'm still a fairly, fairly recent convert to coding standards myself. So what are they? Uh, ultimately, they're rules that your code should, conf should conform to and will be checked against. Uh, there's four language-specific standards, so you've got PHP, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Pleased to say that access uh, accessibility uh, coding standards have just landed recently. So with that, it's not so much just you know, one language, it's just the whole site, you know, the plugin, looking at ways to make sure it's more WCAG uh, compliant. Um, developed for WordPress core, uh, you know, official themes and plugins, that was the you know, initial goal of the co uh, coding standards. And they've been written by the community for the community. So in, this is not just one person or one organization that's just said, here, here's these standards. Everybody's chipped in a little bit. And what surprised me was they've actually existed in some form or other since 2009. Again, I'm quite late to the party here, but I really thought they might have only been around for a year or two, but they've been around for a lot longer than I thought. So what are they not? They're not just for the hardcore. You don't have to have mastery over all the code that's in front of you to use these. Any of us can be using coding standards. They're not just for core contributors. OK, that might have been the initial target audience for these standards, but any developer doing any kind of WordPress work can be, can be using these standards. It's not a definition of right and wrong. It is just the WordPress way. This is how we do it. While it's open to a debate to a degree, you know, there's no point really arguing. These are the standards. That's the way that you code with them. Get on with it and start uh, writing more code. 
they're not there to make you feel guilty. So, you know, you might get a couple of indents incorrect or you might miss um, some spacing in, in a file. It's going to happen. First couple of weeks, I found it quite difficult switching because I'm used to doing things one way, admittedly, slightly more messy way, but you get there in the end. But it's, it's not to guilt trip people. It's just to provide more of a structure. And it's not going to add more complexity to your code. Um, I've actually found in certain situations it's removed complexity in places, which I think is really good. So uh, these are just 10 benefits of switching, you know, from my point of view. There are many benefits of switching over, but I just want to run through 10 of my own. Reduce stress. So I'm not thinking about it anymore. I'm not worrying. So I'm actually writing more code as a, as a result of being less stressed about it. It's more readable, you know, the indentation, the spacing, the structure, naming of things, so much more. It's just so consistent and makes it so much more readable. Much better for teams. So all your code is going to look the same. Doesn't matter who wrote it, when it was. There's no individual developer's fingerprints. You know, we've all, we've all got our little, little bits and pieces that we, that we do. They're going to be gone. Every, everybody's kind of singing from the same hymn sheet. You know, it's the same code no matter what. Um, Future-proofing, so, you know, deprecated functions, um, ignore them, you're always reminded to use new or alternative versions, and that's good because if a function is, is taken out of WordPress in, you know, a few releases time and you're still using it, then that's a major, a major issue that you're going to have to rectify then, so this way it's, it's protecting you from, from that. Uh, faster debugging. So as a result of the code being more readable and easier to scan through, you're going to get to those bugs quicker. You're going to find that line in that error, you know, that, that notice that you got on the, on the home page. You're going to be able to get to that, suss it out more quickly. It's easier to read and understand, so you can actually be a lot more productive when you're, um, when you're de uh, debugging. <clears throat> Things like Yoda conditions are a good example of avoiding really pesky bugs. I mean, you know, typically you would have the constant on the right, the variable on the left. But if you omit one of the equal signs in that, then it's just gonna it's just gonna be truthy. It's gonna be a silent bug that you might take you a little little while to to actually find. So this way, you'll actually get a uh, an error if you um, if you miss an equal sign um, here because obviously the uh, the expression won't won't work the way it should do. Uh, better inline documentation as well. So you're always encouraged to be consistent. Even little, little things like full stops at the end of inline comment lines, it's, it's really nice. Uh, and as a result, you're going to have much more detailed documentation of your code, which is great for you and it's great for everybody else working on the project. <clears throat> um, the code is going to be more secure. You know, it's more consistent validation, sanitization, and escaping of the input and the output. So you'll have no shocks, no surprises. Um, you know, escape all the things kind of mentality. It's, um, it is really good. Um, better database queries because, you know, instead of using WPDB, it's always going to encourage you to use WordPress API functions and classes like WP Query. You know, why not leverage existing caching and performance optimization benefits? You know, do that. Don't try and touch the database directly when there are many other ways for you to actually uh, to do that. The code's a lot easier to maintain. Um, Certainly in, in the world of open source, you know, if you can, if you can put the code down, walk away from the project and know that in three years' time somebody can download the GitHub repo and, you know, it's, it's wonderful to read, you know, it's, it matches the standards that they know and love, That's, um, it's really good for people working on projects in the, in the present but also in the future. So, I'm just going to briefly touch on what you would need to do to switch for PHP, uh, you know, to sniff the PHP. Uh, so you need to get, as Phil touched on, a PHP code sniffer. So you'd install PHP CS on your machine. Uh, you can use Pair or Composer. If you're on a Mac, you've got Homebrew as an option for that as well. Then you just add the path to that PHP uh, CS um, command on, on the system um, to your global path. So that means it's then a global installation that you can use across, uh, across the, uh, the system. Get the coding standards rules from GitHub. Uh, you can get them from uh, using Git, Pair, or Composer, or if you just fancy downloading them, uh, you can do that the old-fashioned way. Pop them in a suitable directory. I put mine in a dot folder in my uh, slash users slash dt green on my Mac, so it's hidden away. Very little chance I'm going to delete that folder accidentally, and it's a nice and centralized uh, location. Decent code editor, so a couple of examples here. I swear by Sublime. Uh, colleagues that make do use Atom, but um, all of them will have some support, whether it be a plugin or you know baked in. Uh, so just find something that has that plugin ecosystem where you can download something, 
or actually has it. I think uh, PHP Storm has it baked in uh, at the box, which is useful. And then just configure PHP code sniffers. So um, once you've set that up, you've pointed it to where your rules live on your, on your drive. There's various options. You can check on save. You can actually change the way that the errors are made available to you. I just have mine in the taskbar at the bottom, but you can have much more visible, um, you know, kind of a drop down that shows you all the errors on, on the page. And uh, as, as Phil touched on, there are actually ways in CoSniffer where some of the issues that you face can actually be resolved automatically for you. So that's a little bit more fiddly to set up, but once it's there, it's, it's a dream to use. Just a quick example of the output, some basic code here. These are actual messages that will come out, so there's no full stop on the inline comment. There should be a one space after the if keyword. Uh, the parenthesis, there's no space before and after. Um, Yoda condition needs to be used there, so that needs to be reversed to avoid you know, those pesky bugs I touched on. Uh, and you know, there should be an extra space before the closing bracket on the third line there. So it's just a sample of what the output would be, really. A couple of useful resources. There's the core handbook on coding standards. Uh, and then the GitHub repo is really for PHP CodeSniff and for coding standards uh, themselves. So just to kind of wrap, comment to wrap up, from my point of view, switching to WordPress coding standards has done more than anything else in recent memory to improve the overall quality of the WordPress code I write. Uh, I wish I'd switched earlier and I encourage you all to switch now and reap the benefits. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. Um, for all the uh, front-end developers in here who thought they were going to get uh, a SaaS, styly SaaS talk, I'm sorry, I'm talking about software as a service. Um, so, uh, yes, can you hear okay? Yes. Boo. Oh. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, the dirty part of WordPress, making money out of it. Um, so, last year I moved our agency towards uh, building a product rather than doing client work, and I'm going to be talking about our journey in creating a product, why we chose to create a product, why we chose SaaS, and why WordPress is a good platform for building a uh, SaaS product. So, I'm going to press spacebar. Yeah, there we go. That's me. Uh, that's uh, that's the, the new product we got, and that's my Twitter, Raising Co. So feel free to uh, flower me with lots of uh, lovely tweets. Okay, so why build a product? Um, the simple answer is it is uh, scalable. So it was uh, always a desire of mine to build a, a more scalable business rather than selling my hours. So we started to create Yogro. And it started out life as a plugin on the WordPress repository. And I'm going to talk about the journey from repository to uh, uh, its own, its own self-hosted install as a WordPress. So the problems I had uh, with the repository are threefold, really. The first is... In an early stage of building a product, it's very hard to, um, to know exactly what your product should look like. You make a lot of assumptions and you make, um, you make a lot of guesswork. Of very informed guesswork, I mind you, but you're making a lot of guesses. And you need that feedback loop so you can really find product market fit with what you've created. And I found on the repository, it's quite hard to generate any feedback because there aren't many mechanisms by which you can contact the people who are installing your product. So if you've got a plugin in there, you can't capture their emails to market to them, and you can't uh, integrate a sort of a, any chat system to talk to them, not that I'm aware of, and I think it's against the repository rules. So once we put our plugin out in the wild, it was very hard to say, hey guys, what do you think of it? Do you want us to, uh, do, do you like what do you like, what don't you like? Um, so this was our, that was the first version of the plugin. In, in, uh, in WordPress, in the repository, for free. Uh, we bid it up for free on the repository because we knew we wanted this feedback period so we could iterate and learn what worked and what didn't work. Um, so that was the first problem with uh, the, the repo. The second one is updates. Now, the repository does give you some information about uh, the usage of your plugin. We can see how many installs we have, but um, it also tells you how many, uh, which version people are using. And we can see that a lot of people weren't updating. And it's really frustrating, especially in these early stages. You know, we're, we've got this idea for a, a product. We want to put it out there. And you're getting lots of feedback, or you're trying to get feedback. And you make a change, and nobody's changing. Nobody's using the new work. So that was quite frustrating. 
Um, even, um, yeah, so nobody updates, really. Well, they do, but like 40% didn't. Maybe they installed it once and never used it again. Again, you can't get any insight on the repository um, into how people are using your product, your plugin. So that was a bit frustrating. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, and the third one I kind of mentioned is gathering people's information for feedback, also for marketing. You've got this idea, you've got this, this sort of uh, embryonic business, you want to, to um, get some more traction on it. If you can't gather that sort of, uh, those email addresses and that sort of, that contact with the user, it's very hard to market your product. So uh, it all led us to moving away from the repository and, and building it a, as a self-installed WordPress site where somebody would be able to log in, create an account, and use what we uh, have built. And all those, th those reasons I just mentioned about the problems with the repository are also the reasons why it was good to have a SaaS, because we could get that feedback straight away. We could push an update, and it would just be live. Um, I wish we had um, really n uh, foregone the repository route because refactoring the code to work on a self-install with multiple users was a lot more development. But hey ho, life's all about learning. So this is what it looks like now. Completely different because we got a lot of feedback about what worked and what didn't work. Um, and that was so. So once we're on the SaaS, because we capture people's logins at the beginning, we can then. Uh, learn and, and use that to contact them and say and start an onboarding um, process which we couldn't do with the repository so we send a series of emails out saying um, what do you like what don't you like let's check the time what you like what don't you like um, and that helped us refine our product offering the the other reason why SAS another reason why SAS worked out really well for us is the integrations that we could do so WordPress as you know is um, got um, uh, such a great ecosystem that many of the services out there will have an existing integration. So we could plug into some fantastic tools and services out there that give us better insights. So if we wanted to see how people were using it, we could plug into um, fullstory.com, which gave you uh, session capturing, or you could do Hotjar, which lets you um, capture the screen, uh, screen clicks and the, the, what's the word, heat map. So, that was really useful to get some insight into um, user behavior. Okie dokie, hold on a sec. <coughs> and I think the, the final point I want to talk about is why use WordPress? And um, we, the lazy reason we use WordPress is because we're WordPress developers. But really, we shouldn't have just jumped into WordPress just because that's what we knew. Why, you know, if you're going to go and build a, a, a SaaS build a business, you should, you should look at all the available options and choose one based on that. But WordPress is fantastic for accelerating your <coughs> development process because it already has built in a lot of functionality. So we had user registrations, we had e-commerce functionality which we required. So we could just um, pick these different modules and requirements that we had and that already sort of out of the box in WordPress and helped us massively accelerate our development program. So it's a really fantastic, um, fantastic platform to build a SaaS on, and I highly recommend it. If anyone has ideas to build a, a subscription site uh, of any sort or a, an online business, then WordPress is uh, really, really helpful in that respect. Um, finally, I'm going to give a plug out to the uh, Post Status uh, podcast, who recently did a, uh, a podcast on SaaS and using it with WordPress. And you can get a much uh, more insightful understanding about the pros and cons from that, uh, from that talk um, where they talk about that as well. So yeah, thank you.
So just uh, go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question for one of our three speakers, and we have a mic runner who will come around. And Hello. Um, I want to ask Elliot, the dashboard that you showed us just then, is that a customized version of the WordPress dashboard, or is it a new dashboard using the REST API? Uh, neither. It is um, a front-end dashboard. So we built a module uh, for the front-end of WordPress, and it does um, lots of things. Um, it, it integrates with Google Analytics and helps stores uh, understand their data, but it's all on the front end of WordPress. So you would log into the site, and then as a user, you would never touch the back end of WordPress. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know it was WordPress. That's the idea. Uh, um, yeah, so first, thanks for the, the talks. Um, my question is on the coding standards. Um, is um, so I, I noticed. I think um, it was some time ago. Now I looked at the codex, but the codex didn't map the coding standards. Um, do you know if if, if the, the org are looking for people to, to to update the codex to match those those standards? I mean, uh, coming as a newbie, you end up writing not in the standards by default if you just follow those. Um, not too sure on that. I think I think there's some efforts to improve. You know. The, the codex side of things at the minute, but yeah, I'm not 100% on that. Sorry, not the best of answers, but. <laughs> Hi, um, so thanks, thanks again for the talks. Elliot, I was just, just curious, you, so Yogo looks like it integrates for WooCommerce customers. Is that what you used for actually building your SaaS product, or did you use something else? Yeah, we use WooCommerce um, in our site. Um, it's really good, and it's, well, it's what we know. And it's also really adaptable, so it's a, it's a good uh, plugin to use. Squeaky chair. Yeah, no, my first question was. But it was answered was why to flip the conditions, the Yoda conditions, but you, you answered that. So thanks, because that was, there was an argument at work uh, that, <laughs> that I can now go back. And he said, it's wrong. And I said, well, I'm not too sure the whole core would have been flipped because it's wrong. So thanks. The second question was about uh, the reviewing process that you were saying. Uh, just recommendations on if I'm re reviewing someone else's code, uh, you know, obviously, I'll be making changes to it. Like, how do you, how do you feed that back? Is it through a different kind of commish? Or, you know, how do I, what what process do you use basically? Um, I guess it, I guess it kind of depends. Uh, I guess it kind of depends what um, you kind of have to make that process yourself. So um, the way we do it is that we we get code. Uh, submitted. Um, so there's two ways we get submitted. There's like a like there's a theme up or whatever, um, and then um, or they commit code into a repository and we review commits uh, individually. And what we do then is we feed back. So we actually say to the developer, uh, this code should probably change because of this. Uh, this is the relevant standard or this is the relevant documentation. Then the developer will change it and we'll review it again. And, and that's how the process works for us. Um, it's probably better that if you're doing code review um, to actually to, to do it that way so that you've got the developer, the original developer is actually changing their code um, because that's a better way to learn. Uh, if you've got to change your code, then you're more likely to absorb that in and take that in as a, a thing that you've, that you've then learned. You're more likely to absorb that rather than me as a reviewer changing your code for you, you're never going to learn. It's like you handing your your essay into a teacher and your teacher changing it. It's, that's not going to help you learn. Um, you learn better by just going through that process and, and doing it because you, you're unlikely to do that again because it delays you deploying your code and everything. So um, I'd suggest that's the way to do it is actually to feed that back uh, directly and have the developer change it. So it's more of a feedback process rather than just going in and changing. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay, yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I mostly just do uh, theme and don't touch plugins at all. But for in Sublime, um, I mean, obviously you've got PHP Lint and so on. 
but is there ever going to be, or is there already, a uh, add-in for Sublime that we can use for WordPress standards? Sorry, could you, my hearing's a little bit bad. Could you just repeat that a bit louder? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, for in Sublime, Sublime Text, yeah. um, Sublime Text Free, is there a plugin that we can use equivalent to the likes of PHP Lint that we can use specifically for WordPress standards? Um, from what I've seen, there's no WordPress specific plugin that just can leave you install and that's it. Everything's there out of the box. Um, to be honest, I've not looked for a couple of months. I mean, I've got a, a few different apps in there, or plugins rather. I've got kind of Sublime Code Intel, I've got you know, Linter, I've got Code Sniffer. So I, I've got a bit of a mismatch of, of different things. But um, if there isn't one that just makes it work out of the box, then there certainly needs to be, yeah. But I've, I've not seen anything myself, no. It's just to have, uh, it's more for theme and standards, you know, for the check after. You've created a theme that you can do some sort of review on up there. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've, I've not seen anything on, on that. One last question. Hi, on the coding standards side, is there anything that you can um, automatically tie in to do security checks, or would that be covered by general code standards? In terms of like the sanitization and validization, just craziness that you might put in there. <laughs> All sorts um, of things, really. They used to be WP secure, where you'd kind of load things on. Um, yeah. But scan your whole site. But I've not used anything that's automatically done that. I mean, I I just I just base it on the you know the errors you know repeatedly telling me you know you forgot to escape, escape this, you forgot to sanitize that. But I've not used any. I've not gone beyond that stage to add anything in that automates that side of it anymore, really. But um, it's good. Good point, actually, if, if there's something out there, but Phil might have a... I think for security things, a lot of the time, um, it can be a bit more nuanced. So um, it's, it's harder to detect security issues with automated code review because sometimes it might be... I can't think of a good example. Um, you kind of have to understand the code and what it's doing and realise that actually, all that variable just there, um, the way that variable is formed, it might contain user input and you haven't actually sanitized it properly. And you're only really going to know that by looking at the code and reading it. Because an automated tool might not know that that's coming from user input and that it obviously needs to be sanitized. So um, I think you're more likely to need to do manual code review for those kind of things. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's, there's, there is a decent amount of automated stuff that will catch some things. Uh, but you want to you look at it manually for security stuff. Time for one last one. Hello. Slightly more of an addition to the last one. Um, if you install the WordPress coding standards for PHP Code Sniffer, it does come with a handful of other coding standards as well, which extend it. And one of those is the VIP coding standards. Yeah. And while, as Phil just said, you can't automate the detection of escaping that's been missed and things like that, the coding standards well, the VIP version will attempt to do it and will catch some of them, if not all. So you still need to read through. But, for example, when I'm in Sublime and I save something and it's a file I'm not familiar with, sometimes it will say, you outputted something and we expected an escaping function, but we didn't see one and saw we saw, instead we saw this. Or we were expecting WP on slash here, but we didn't see it. You might want to take another look and go through it. But um, I think another one, maybe partially just to kind of pick Phil's brains in terms of how he sends feedback. Um, I can be rather sarcastic at times. And if anybody's seen my Instagram, I've probably had a little bit too much bubbly, which is not good when you've done a review and you then have to send feedback. And the client is a big company and you don't want to offend them. Uh, what kind of strategy do you use to write up feedback and make sure that you don't end up saying something untowards. Because re reading code and deciding that this is not good and this isn't good enough, you can't just tell someone that the code is terrible and awful and stuff. You, you know, the, the consequences, how do you get around that and being polite and nice and very politely telling them no? I just write, your code is terrible, please fix it. <laughs> um, Code is terrible. By the way, that invoice is still outstanding. It's <laughs> a good one. Um, no, no, it's a good point because um, yeah, as developers, we spend a lot of time writing code and we take a lot of pride over our work and what we do. So if someone then turns around and says, "Actually, <clears throat> it's not so great," that's kind of that can be a hard pill to swallow. 
So it's really, it's really important if you are doing code reviews to someone, is the language you use and the way that you do that feed, give that feedback, is, is you're not, you're not criticising the developer. The developer isn't bad. The developer isn't writing. Is yeah, the developer isn't a bad person for writing this particular bit of code that might have an issue. The code is the problem. The code isn't doing perhaps what it needs to do, or it perhaps isn't doing it in the right way. So it's important to to use language that reflects that. So if 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 there's a Yoda condition or not a Yoda condition, for example, and it needs to be, then you say this condition here would be better off as a Yoda condition. So you're not saying anything about the developer. You're not saying you've done this condition wrong. Um, you're saying that actually that would be better off like this. You're not saying it should be. You're not saying you must do this. You're not telling them what to do. You're suggesting that the code would be better if this were to be the case. Um, it can be really difficult to get that right. And actually, that's a lot of what me and Tom do every day is to make sure that we are talking to developers in the most helpful way possible. It plays into the learning as well, because we're constantly, constantly talking to developers about their code and how, how it could be better, and actually helping them to learn from that to improve their code so that they don't have to wait even longer for their code to be deployed because there's issues with it. Final round of applause for our... <laughs> We are going to have a short break. We have about 30 minutes. You can go get some more coffee. Uh, I imagine our speakers will be making themselves available if you ever have more questions and want to talk to them. Uh, your closest and best bet for coffee is in the Graduate Center, so the middle building. Um, and we will see you back here at uh, 10.50, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for Julie.